Well, again, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming, particularly on a weather day like this. Yeah, I won't. I think a lot of you know me. Um, yeah, I, and again, for the room, I didn't anticipate the depth. So you can read this, but some things you won't be able to read. So I'll violate the principal presentation when I put something up that's small. I won't read it. So don't be, don't be concerned about that. Uh, you have the 35 years of being in business as a collecting acronym CPA, CFO, CEO. I collect another one, registered corporate coach. I, like, I guess I like acronyms. Mm -hmm. But I'm a business coach, I'm a career coach, and uh, also a general consultant, and I own the firm. And I'll talk about the relation with Bossy in, in just a minute. But again, what we're talking about here is entrepreneurial DNA. So my, my goal here is threefold. First is to impart and share entrepreneurial DNA. What's it about? How does it relate to you? Then to give with that, give you some insight and awareness in terms of how you're wired. And that might suggest what type of people and companies you should be targeting. Or if you're working for a company, how to work best within that company. And that's really the third part. And that is about how do you assess your fit with an organization, whether you're already in it or interviewing for it. So you notice I'm, I'm trying to accommodate both, both parties here. Because uh, it, it is about fit. And people who know me, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, I'm, my frustration with the current job market is it's backwards, right? It's, it's about the specs, and it needs to be about fit and capabilities first, okay? So this gets to that. So if this works, by the way, teamwork here. I didn't have it automatic. I almost had to have Vince advance these slides. I would have to fire the third side. It was very, very difficult. But Joe gave me the, 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 this with dead batteries. Restaurant was able to switch out batteries for me, so it's teamwork, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> this does work. Let's see. It does work. So Bossy. Uh, so in addition to having my own coaching and consulting firm, I'm also a partner with Bossy Global. Bossy is a uh, they develop entrepreneurial DNA, and it's the belief there that everybody has an entrepreneurial DNA within themselves. We're all entrepreneurs, and then inner inner. Entrepreneurial DNA, say that really quick. Inner entrepreneurial <laughs> DNA is unique within all of us. There's infinite combinations, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And, that, and what we believe is, if you understand your entrepreneurial DNA and what to do with it, we believe that's game changing. It really is. And hopefully you'll see it as we, as we move along. And by the way, I'd like this to be really interactive, so as questions come up, please raise your hand. The other thing that's been alluded to, and if you've been to some of my other presentations, I like things to be interactive. I like things to be experiential, because that's how you ground things that have been discussed. So hopefully most of you have taken the assessment. If not, it takes a few minutes. Do it after the session and see how it compared to what we just talked about. <coughs> well, let's start. A technical slide. Um, so. Are these dogs the same? If you were a betting person and you had to bet your life savings on who would win a race, who would you bet on? Would it be the Greyhound or would it be the Beagle? I know the Beagle's really cute. Which one would you do, right? They're dogs, but are they, are they wired the same? Do they have different elements to them? The same can be said for us. If you remember in business school, in school in general, it's all taught as if you're the same, right? And it's how do you break out of that and understand how you're different. These guys do, right? The only thing that's common is they'll leave presents for you to step in the backyard. But other than that, they're different. Let's do one other comparison. So, if you had to hire a scary guard dog, which one would you select? If you were looking for a cuddly, warm, affectionate dog you wanted to bring into your family, who would you select? They're both dogs, but their, quote, DNA is a bit different, right? They're wired differently. So wouldn't we think that people are also wired differently? Are we the same? Here's where the font's going to get smaller. I'll read it, don't worry. 
I thought the room was going to be really small. <laughs> so again, as I said, the differentiation in today's job market is skills and experience. It's about the specs. People are looking for differences in the specs. I think we all realize two people can have the same specs. They could both be dogs. One could be a greyhound, one could be a beagle. Which one does the company need? Which one does the beagle or greyhound want, right? So again, focus on self and fit, to me, hasn't really kept up with the times. We don't have that level of awareness, at least in my mind. In certain areas, certain places we do, but by and large, technology has actually dampened this in my view. This is my opinion. But we are different. We're different in what energizes us. One of my daughter's boyfriends, they enamored with sports. They're like hooked to the TV on the weekend. That really energizes them. Me, I like to try to play sports. That doesn't, you know, watching sports doesn't energize me. Playing, it does. So we're different in terms of what energizes us. How we add value. Yeah, a lot of people here are finance folks, but there's so many other different ways you can add value. I want, you, I want you to just be thinking about that a little bit. How do you add value to your workplace, to your life in general? Who do we work best with? Do you envision that you can go into any team and work well with that team? Have you ever had a situation where you worked with a team and said, my goodness, we really clicked, really got everything done. This was a lot of fun. Have you ever been in a team where it's been a drudgery? It's been, you know, a weight, a burden. It's the lens by which you make decisions. Somebody I was talking to earlier this morning said, you know, this is a really cool personality test. And I'll tell you, people would think about that. Entrepreneurial DNA is not about personality. It's about the lens with which one looks into to make decisions in business. You can be an ENTJ or an INTP, and you be very different DNA. So they are different. This is just how you make decisions. You can have an introvert that's a builder, an extrovert that's a builder. We can talk about that more. So this is more generally about how you're wired for decision making, for writing business, for relationship. So, the Bossy Quadrant. What does Bossy stand for? Well, the B is builder. O is opportunist, S is specialist, and I is innovator. And for those of you who took the assessment, you, you, you have at least a primary score, primary letter. And you might have a secondary or even more. They could be capital, they could be lowercase. That really speaks to the degree you're in that quadrant, okay? We all have a little bit in, in all of us. But that's what you're going to see. Now, when I go through each of these, I'm going to really address the extremes, just so we have a flavor for what they are. So please don't, or perhaps do, ascribe to what I'm saying to you. You might be an extreme, I don't know. And we'll touch upon combinations later. Again, I talked about it's not a personality assessment, it's more of what lines you look for. When you have this awareness, you're going to have a better idea of what businesses you fit into. The role you need to play in that business and how to best serve in that role. And finally, the people. What people are you going to work best with? Or can you work best with? Again, we're going to focus on the extremes. And as you can guess in here, there are multiple combinations. And we'll touch upon that a little bit later on. Let's start with builder DNA. And a raise of hands, if, if you're comfortable. How many had a B as their first letter? Thank you. Thank you. How many had a B capital as their first letter? Thank you. <coughs> Glad you're in the back. I can run out the door over here and just start to talk about it. No. <laughs> they all have their. Anything, they all have their strengths and their value, but anything to an extreme can become a weakness. We all know this, right? So a builder, they're the serial entrepreneur, right? They want to create high-scale, sustainable growth. They want to get the five million within a couple of years and explode from there, right? That's a builder. They're the Pied Piper. They are great at attracting capital and phenomenal talent. 
People are enamored with their passion, their story, their vision. At the same time, these people are so typically possessed with it, they can become controlling to the point of obsession. It can be good and bad depending on the circumstances. And it's all about infrastructure. If you ask a, a builder about the business, they talk about it in terms of size. I have 12 factories, I have 3 million square feet, I have 40,000 employees. That's typically what they'll say first. Profits, if you ask them, they'll talk about it, but it's really about infrastructure and size. That's what drives that market share and growth. What's the Achilles heel? Relationships. Again, to an extreme. These people can, can go through people like a tornado. Use people, leave them dead in the hall. <laughs> including family members. Anybody run across people like this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they know you. <laughs> Did anybody see Steve Jobs, the movie? Yeah. Which is basically. Yeah. And he probably has a little bit of innovator in too. He talks about combinations. Let's talk about opportunists. How many were O's? Okay. Didn't expect too many in a finance group. Okay, how about capital law? Okay. Oh, all right. I produce the salesperson, right? They want to be in the right place on the ground floor. And here's a secret. What they really want, what they really want in the extreme. They want to make a ton of money, cash out, sit on the beach, and never work again. <laughs> now, my guess is we all have a little bit of that in us. <laughs> Kind of day, no? Depending on the day, yeah, and who you're working with, right? <laughs> the business is a vehicle. Most people are in the business, not because of the mission and the business, they're in it for themselves. But that's okay, right? They get paid that way. A lot of salesmen get paid that way, right? They're unbelievably optimistic, again, to the extreme. You could have invested in something with these folks and lost a ton of money. The next day they say, this is the one. We need to invest in this. Has anybody come across people like that? <laughs> what you'll find is they jump to the next shiny penny, that, 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 that. So sometimes they leave places really quick. It's hard to hold on to these people. But sometimes if they like a bunch of things, they try to do all those things. So you'll find they typically have several streams of income. Oh, yeah, I'm doing something for these guys. I'm consulting here. I invested in this thing over here. They have multiple streams of income. They want financial freedom. They're going to work really hard for it for a period of time, as long as they know that's going to happen. So again, that's the vehicle of financial freedom. And what do you think their Achilles heel is? It's focus. Yeah. Right. They don't apply themselves fully to one thing to achieve all they can. They're, they're constantly looking. Their fear, they don't want to miss out on an opportunity. Okay. So I can tell you how to sell these people, too, if you want. <laughs> Maybe you can guess. Buy it before they run out. <laughs> Those people are going to go there. Okay, so that's opportunity. Specialist. I'll be very curious. How many in the room had an S? As a primary. As a primary. Interesting. How about capital? Interesting. It's a nice diverse group because, again, I would expect most finance people to fall to have this as at least one of their categories because the specialist is the expert. These are the people that strive to be great at what they do. And they typically stay within a single industry. Why? It's how they attain their expertise, how they retain it and grow it. Their expertise, their expertise is their reputation. We'll talk about that in a second. They're very analytical, which could be good. It could be safeguarding, making informed decisions, but from a, sometimes from a builder opportunist perspective, it could be slowing growth to a halt. Ever run into those situations? They're wonderful at networking. Usually, believe it or not, they really are. That's different than selling. We'll talk about that. And why are they good? They network really well with people of their own type, and the networking creates referrals and and a lot and the excellent service they're going to provide brings in referrals. So it's a natural way to work together. So people do network and refer pretty well. But again, reputation for a specialist is sacrosanct. 
personally and professionally. They'll protect us like nothing else. It's very dear to them. What's the, what's the Achilles heel here? Lead generation, selling. It's a little different than networking. Going out and actually selling what you have, the approach you do it, as opposed to the referrals, and I know this person, see this person, it's a little different, okay? Um, I know I, showed, I sold shoes as a kid, and I was really good at it, but what I realized was people were walking in the door to buy shoes. I didn't see myself going door to door to sell vacuum cleaners, okay? That's the extreme. But lead generation, there's a lot of specialists, and I saw some, some frowns and rumors I think is, is valid, that will say, you know, I'm getting business, it's okay, but why can't I stand out amongst the competition? Why are those guys getting all that stuff over there and they're building this? And, well, maybe that's a little scum. There's, there's a whole bunch of reasons. The specialists will struggle with that, typically. Okay? That's specialists. Innovators. As you might guess, they're the mad scientists, right? They want to create things that are going to change the world. High energy that way. They love the aha moments. They like to see something and say, this is going to be great, right? They love to be in their labs. They're hard to find these people because they're hidden in dungeons and labs. That's a lot of great stuff out there. You've got to find them, right? And sometimes business finds them. So they have limitless IP. They're all about the impact and the mission. It's not about the dollars or profits. It's about what they're going to do and how that's going to serve the world. Right? So what's their weak spot? They're, terrible, they're typically terrible business operators. Oftentimes, innovators will be pulled or pushed, forced into entrepreneurship. You got this great thing. You got to make it, you got to develop a business around it. They like the mission. They'll avoid like the play difficult people decision and issues. They're very trusting. If you're loyal to me, you must be good. You know where that can go sometimes, right? To the people you bring into the organization. They're not wired that way. They don't want to just be in the lab do their work. Can you read this back? Can you read that back here? No. All right, okay, I'll, uh, sorry about that. I'm just looking at these traits a little bit differently. So if I look at, at this from a trait standpoint, a builder is the driver. They're driving the business, right? The opportunist is a speculator. I'm going to bet on this, bet on this, bet on this for the big, for the big payout, sitting on the beach. The specialist, I want to be the expert. I want to provide great client service, and, and through my expertise, but provide great client service, get referrals based on that great client service. And the other just wants to be creative. I just want to, you know, make things. So in business, the builder, what do they want to do? They want to expand the business. It's all about expansion. The opportunist just wants to promote it so they can bring money in, get their commission to sit on the beach. The specialist wants to serve, okay? wants to enable the business to grow sustainably and be successful. And the innovator says, just let me design more stuff. Give me more money and more, to more toys to design more things. So, assuming the person is not psychotic, how they show up in business can be how they show up at home, right? So, what does that mean for home life? Well, let's touch on this. A builder, typically, there'd be a lot of collateral damage because the way that they blow through people, they use people, and they pull people and work sometimes bleeds into the home life. But again, I, I'm really talking about extremes here just to give you a sensitivity. The opportunist. If they're involved in one, two, three things and they're really passionate about it, they're going to be totally absorbed in that to the expense of their family. When they're not involved in something, they can be gregarious, really fun-loving, great people to be with, unless you don't share their optimism or something. They don't want to be around people that don't share their optimism. They'll shut you out. Okay? The specialist, of all the quad, of all the, quad the specialist typically has the best home-life balance because they're typically able to check out their expertise at the door when they come home and not bring that with them. They're, they're able to actually make that adjustment is what it'd be fine. So for the special in the room, good for, good for you or us. 
the innovator. They have a problem with their off switch. Remember, it's about the mission. They've created something. They identify with what they created. If it's working and people are accepting it, they're, they're sky high and they bring everybody, raise them up with them. If it's not working or there's problems, they get very low, almost at a point of depression, pulling everybody down with them. A lot of times you can tell innovators they're moody, depending on what's going on within the business. So what do you do about these people? Well, the builder, to the extreme, buffer and protect. Let them build the business, but for gosh sakes, keep them away from the people. <laughs> Find somebody who can manage the people. Right? A lot of times you see a COO that's a real people, and, then, and the CEO is just out there, right? So buffer and protect. The opportunist would be somebody you want to coach. Help them get focus. Help them prioritize. Help them try to connect a little better. The specialist, and we'll talk about this in a second, is outsourcing. You cannot do everything on your own. Experts believe they can be experts in everything. Right? And that resonates with people. Because you know, I'm always thinking about the worst thing that's going to happen. If I bring a specialist, uh, somebody in, and it doesn't work, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? Well, I'm going to be failed, it's going to be my reputation, whatever it is, right? And again, I can do this on my own. They need help. Because oftentimes they're overburdened, they take on too much work, and that's a familiar pattern. The innovator. Bye-bye CEO. Get that person out of the business. Have them work in the lab. That's where, they, that's where their gifting is. That's where they provide the most value. Does that make sense? We were talking, a couple of people were talking about, boy, it'd be nice to have, you know, to see what my team would look like. We do team DNA assessments, okay? Um, so again, in terms of scale, sales, service, and, and innovation, look at those. That's an example of a team, a real example of how people applied it on the graph, right? So let me ask you, what do you think are the Good things that are going on, what do you think of the challenges? Anybody from the room? To make this a little more interactive? Yes. They they, they know their stuff because they're specialists. Um, they probably don't uh, have, build a good reputation in the company or find opportunities all that well. And they certainly don't think of anything new. <laughs> Anybody else? Good. Get along with others or work well with others? Yeah, they have a hard time with uh, sort of scaling and building their whatever their specialty is. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So this CEO was very was was pleased about the client service. Yeah. What's the the blue and red? The difference between the, blue the dots. And the red dots. dots. Oh, the dots. These were these were people from different. Uh, we won't. These are different levels of management. Uh, at times, you know. But based on this, based on what you're saying, so you can't see it from the back, um, <laughs> great client service. So everybody's really pleased at what this company is providing. And you know, when they have things to sell, they have some folks in sales. They can they can sell. The frustration is the CEO had is, as somebody pointed out, they're not doing anything new. Oh, sorry. I tried to. Uh, I fired. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, I'll get back to where I was. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Recovery. He was frustrated because he didn't feel they were maintaining their competitiveness in the marketplace. So while they provided great service, he was losing out on jobs because people had more innovative, more current to the market offerings. They didn't have anybody innovating for the company, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's an example. I've walked into a couple of tech companies. They had, you know, a bunch of programs, the S's. They had a few I's. They knew that the things, the technology would change the world, right? And they had a founder who was a, was a big builder. And they couldn't get it off the ground. Why is that? Nobody to sell. This is great. Come, isn't this thing great? 
but nobody outwardly going out to promote it. Nobody has incentive to sit on the beach, so this is, I'm going to sell the heck out of this thing as an experiment, right? So what about your company? Try to visualize. You can do this, too, if you want. We can arrange. You can have your company do a team DNA assessment to have this come out. How about the target company you're looking at? You've been interviewing companies, you're interviewing the management team. Where do these people fall? And how about the session here? I don't have all the stats, but I wonder how we would map out here. Um, I think we'd have a combination of things, which is kind of nice. I probably, we'd probably be a, a little light here. I saw some people, a few up here, a lot here, a couple here. Do we have anything to not? Secondary. Secondary. Primary? Primary out? I can't remember, but okay. it definitely sounds So if we, were, we, if we were a team here, we would know what we probably need, right? That insight, whether you're in a company or targeting a company, is going to give you a real good flavor for how you can fit in. Because you make a choice how you fit in and how you can add the most value, right? If I was a salesperson, and I came into a company that didn't have any of that, I'd sit there and go, man, you've got this great vision, you've got great support, you've got great, great innovation. Let me monetize that for you, right? The investors will say, how much can we pay? I think that this is a question. Do you see uh, that in certain industries, there's a more common profile? So if, you, if you're in professional services, for example, you might be really tilted to one of the quadrants versus maybe some other, other businesses. Yes. Uh, and let me give you a perfect example of that. Accounting firms. We're familiar with those, right? <laughs> 30, 40 years ago, I only read this. I don't know this for a fact. I just read this in history books. Um, it was, how did they sell? Word of mouth, referrals, and then eventually reputation. I mean, they gave it time, whatever, right? What do some of these firms have now? Business development people. Business development people. <clears throat> because they realize, by and large, most accounting firms will not have the O there. The audit won't have the I there. They're scared of that, right? But they need O's. Well, the good old days, they had some innovators. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. <laughs> That's why Arthur Anderson is around yeah. anymore. Do you. <laughs> do you know if you do this for a company? Let's say you had, let's say that was split, the left side was flipped, so all those dots were up in B and left, and then two down in S. I mean, would that be a problem if you had like too many builders in, in a company? Again, it's about balance, yeah. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. I mean, you know, you're going to, you, if, if you are an S working for a bunch of builders, your life is probably hell. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. no joke. They're going to drive you, <laughs> drive you into the ground, okay? You, and you're going to ask more resources. You don't want more resources. You're going to build. You know, builders will typically say, people drive me nuts. Yeah. They literally do. Why aren't they on the program? Why do they leave my, don't they see this? The opportunities doesn't care. They just want the money. But building opportunities go along really well. They feed on each other. Great vision. Oh, I can help you on. Great, great. They do this, right? That's the control point. Well, a lot of the professional services business, so it used to be a rainmaker was one. Now everybody's got to be a rainmaker because right. if they don't bring in the revenue, you know, eat what you kill. That's right. And that's difficult for a lot of people because right. they're not wired that way. Okay? They're going out of their gifting. It's like the innovator running a company. Usually it's a disaster. So, let me see how much you're at. Okay. What we'll do here, I think this is going to come. Somebody mentioned this. You know, there's combinations. We'll just touch on this a little bit. But I want to do this in a more interactive way. I could talk a lot about this, but I want to make sure it's interactive. You're starting to get this, and I see you starting to make the connections. Upper quadrant. And upper doesn't mean better or lower, it's, just, it's a box, right? You've got to go upper, lower, side. B, O, O, B, B, or O. Upper quadrant. What are these people? Big picture thinkers. Scale. 
right? Anything else? It can be. It might be inter it could be introverts. The vote which is a very intense introvert. But it's about promotion. It's about building. Growing the top line. It's about scale. Right? Um, anything else? Think these people work well together? Yeah. They feed off each other. Yeah. They feed off each other, right? B gets all excited. And O makes B more confident, and it's just a, a swirl, which can sometimes crash. But that's how it works. How about the lower quadrant? Great service. Always looking to provide the best thing for their clients, right? Anything else? They're creative. They can be creative. We'll talk about the quadrant. It's most, but it's most creative. They can be creative. Yeah. But these people don't like to sell. Right. There's no like more to sell. They don't like to sell. But they do great things. Right. And it's important. Builders and opportunists. If they don't have anything to sell, they're not going anywhere. Right. So you can see how that we need all these pieces. Right. right? BS. Somebody was joking about that mm -hmm. BS. A couple people came up to me. See, BS is not sales. But I'll tell you, here's an example. When you combine builder DNA and specialists, what happens? You can get a pretty uh, 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 overconfident, driven taskmaster because they want to grow a company and they have the expertise to do it. Could be a very dangerous combination. It could be a very useful combination. Can you see where that that can play off each other? BS is a funny acronym, but that it's not a salesperson. But these are these are scale, big picture thinkers. They manage infrastructure extremely well. But again, relationships and patience are an issue. What's the downside to those two? The downside is the tension of I want to build, but the specialist goes, not so fast. We're going to grow to death. Well, what, you're holding me back. Mm -hmm. No, I'm trying to protect us, making sure we don't go over the edge. You don't believe in my, in, in my vision. Yes, I do. So there can be that tension within a company. Right? These are the, the creative opportunists, and they can feed it off each other, too. And by the way, these people are pretty much fun-loving people. They're really fun to be around. They love to be around people, but they do not like to manage people and infrastructure. They also leave me alone, let me sell. The eye goes, let me just do stuff in my lab. I don't want to have to make those tough people decisions. Keep me away from that. I don't want to be bothered with that, right? But they're the creators. Oh, the other thing on B I was going to mention, in the business of the opportunist, not a lot of control over the checkbook. I just want to make it I think that will be right. resonant with people here. Think about that. Okay? There are cost quadrants, right? The yin and the yang. This is where you have a lot of the opposites. I mean, the finance guy and the sales guy. We've all been in those conversations, right? Internet and build it. There's places where there's tensions and there's places where there's synergies. Give me more, oh, that's great innovation. I'm going to sell this thing to the roof, right? The oh, let me just, let's just do this. No, you can't just do that. So you can see where there's tensions. And people that have this combination, there are people with these sort of combinations. Anybody have that in the room here? A cross quadrant? Okay, okay. The idea is to work through the frustration and get to the checks and balance that will enable you to bring your best gifts forward. It's actually a unique combination to have, but it's something you have to work through. You probably, you, I don't know if you realize the struggle sometimes within yourself, but that often happens. So the impact of all this we've talked about to you, to your team, to your prospective employer. What is this awareness? What's the impact of this? 
your strategy. Again, it's really important you understand the lens with which you look through and make decisions. And to the extent you can assess that in others, the more power to, to you. It'll be game changing for you because you really understand fit from a very unique perspective. You'll be able to put the right people around you that advocate for you. So as you build your teams, think about who you're bringing in. We won't have time to get to it here, but the one thing is, and people have always asked me, what kind of questions should you be asking, right? You can ask people what they've done, but to really get an insight on their DNA, how they're wired, ask them how they did it. Ask them how they did it. Tell me your story. Not this, tell me about yourself. Tell me your story and see what happens. How they describe doing it. How is a builder going to describe it? Oh, we got to build this factory, we built this, we built this. Innovators are going to be, I developed this, I created this, right? I help, you know, the service and the opportunist. They all have different ways they're going to describe how they achieve something. And you, you can sense it from there. And if you ask about their frustrations, like I said before, people drive me nuts. That's a good, that's a good uh, indicator of where they're coming from, right? People don't believe this can change the world. They don't believe in the product. That might be the end of it. Does that kind of resonate with people? I just want to get people sensitive. I am sensitive at the time, too. So next steps. Always next steps, right? <clears throat> Dig more into your own DNA. Understand it more. And, you know, uh, if, if it's something that doesn't seem to resonate with you, you can talk to me. You can take the, the advanced assessment. Not that expensive, but you can get, get deeper into who you are if, if it didn't resonate with you. Again, lenses and drivers. Understand what drives each of the DNAs, what drives you. Think about that. If you can assess who you're speaking with, you know what drives them, you know what drives you, and you have that knowledge, I think that's really powerful. It helps you make decisions. So asking the right questions. You can remember, not just the what, but the how. How did you do that? See what they said. That will give you some insight. And seek out help. You shouldn't have to do this all on your own. And this is an example of, of connection and seeking help and, and thing. It's more indirect, but do seek out help. So to the mountaintop, I know you can't be back. <laughs> but if you can assess yourself, and you can assess management that you're working with or targeting, you will find the right job and stay in the right, in the right job. I'm, I'm pretty convinced of that. That's the material I had to discuss. Um, any questions, comments, thoughts? I had, I had a question, just yeah. kind of the gamesmanship of the interview process. So if, um, let's say you've got a good handle on yourself, but uh, you're, you're, going, you're going to interview with a, a number of individuals in a firm, you, you may or may not know um, much about them you know, in advance of that process. Uh, so how can you use this to kind of correlate your approach to that interview to the individual sort of dynamics of of those people that are going to be doing the interview. That's a great question. Did everybody, did everybody hear that? Okay. It's how do you prepare yourself for an interview, and, and if you don't know the people ahead of time, how do you tailor your discussion to kind of fit that, right? Exactly. Right. Sometimes you don't know. Now, what you'd like to do is be able to talk to, if there's people that you know in your network or people know the company, they might give you some of their own insights. Now, that could be biased, but you want to at least have, if you can get that. If you have nothing and you walk in, Again, you're going to have to effectively acclimate and react to what you see. And again, a lot of that's going to be questions and how would you do that? And you'll get, you'll get a sense. Um, you, you've heard the adage, walk into somebody's office, look what's on their desk, what's on their, what's on their credentials, whatever it is. 
You see all these trophies? That tells you something. If you see, you know, uh, just family and kids, that tells you something else. So it's looking for those tell signs. But sometimes you won't know until you start asking the questions, and then you're going to start tailoring from there. Does that make sense? Or ask them to take the free assessment. Yeah. Right. <laughs> then you got to call me because that comes to me. Yeah, Jeff. Or what I would do is think of a couple questions and ask that the same question to everybody you're interviewing and see how they answer. Yeah. And to that, exactly. So everybody asks the same question. To everybody. Yeah, to everybody. Yeah. And I would ask the how question <laughs> and see how people answer it. You'll get, you can get your own flavor for what that team looks like in some ways. And when you get, ask them about struggles or challenges, that's a big one that comes out, right? You know, I can't get, you know, Vince, you know, it's like, he's like Mr. No. Every time I try to bring something to him, he's always saying no. <laughs> Is that your CFO? Yes, our CFO. Yeah, I got that. Okay. So some of it is the frustration piece too. That'll bring it out. Any other thoughts, questions? Again, it's another way of looking at things, but I think it's general enough and intuitive enough where you can apply it to yourself. And by the way, you want to have a little fun with it. You got your work team. <coughs> Figure out your family team if you want to have a little fun. Um, <laughs> And be, feel free to take the, the assessment. And I'm happy to talk with you more about it as, if you need to. Feel free to call me. Um, from the team perspective, uh, you know, we talked about uh, a little bit about important to have fit. Um, and I'm thinking about that graph that you put up there, yeah. right? Where, where a lot of the people are specialists. But it seems that uh, really, if you're going to be real effective, you almost need some of each. So how do you balance the, the concept of fit um, versus the fact that you really want, you know, like this group right here, right, can certainly use an innovator uh, to, to stay current on things or, to, you know, develop new things for people to sell. Um, you know, but, you know, that person, you know, if you hire one innovator sitting in their lab, they're going to be somewhat ostracized from the rest of the group. So how do you get that? But you need that person. So, I, yeah, so how do you reconcile fit with the fact that you, you probably want some beach? What we'll do, and I can do this too. Has everybody heard the DISC assessment? Yeah. 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 Awareness. So to bring that person in, the innovator, make sure they're not ostracized or not in their dark, who wants to go down there, right? They have to be, the team has to be aware of their value. And they have to be aware of their value. So it's crazy that when you bring somebody in, what the purpose is, and, and maybe to the team building dynamics of life together. You know, so that's part of it. But to your point, I do think you need balance, you know, in, in these things. I mean, there are certain situations. If you're in the, uh, you know, some think tank for the government, and all your job is to create things, well, that's different, right? You don't need it. You don't need one of each. But in most businesses, you do, to some degree. And again, remember, it isn't having one person in one and one person in the other. Some people have both. Some people are on the line, like these people here. If you need innovation, you might be able to help develop and, and, and bring some people more into their innovation DNA. Right? So you can help complement by doing that. But they have to be in their gifting. It might be something like, oh, this is great. I've never done this before. This is going to be a lot of fun. So sometimes your existing people you can utilize in a different way knowing where they're predisposed. Does that make sense? So what color were the senior people? I don't remember. I don't remember. I think they were I think they were brown. But I don't remember. And sometimes these are different color, different things. It could be, it could be seniority, it could be departments. You can the colors don't it could be based on how you want to stratify the population. Do you see companies using like this analysis in the pre-hire stage? You know, I can actually see that working pretty well. I mean, why not? Uh, particularly the, uh, the 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 pre the pre assessment, but I also think the the more advanced one. There's a few more questions, a little more in depth analysis. Yeah. We we, um, we utilized last I said we utilized this quite a bit. 
sure. and had everyone go to a full day training it was about one understanding each other. Right. But the other thing also is when we were hired for, for a particular position, we knew which quadrant mm -hmm. we wanted them to be leaning towards right. and be a better fit for that type of position. Right. Right. Yeah, kind of a basic question, but when you think of the specialist and the resident expert, when you think of the finance and controlling groups, what what kind of things just generally come to mind that they would be experts at, just from a very general standpoint? You mean from a financial group? Yeah. What are things that you would think that they would need to be experts at? Well, analysis, strategy, processes, those sort of things. The discipline. They're the underpinning of the organization. In other words, the builder's out growing, the O's out selling, the I's out innovating. Somebody needs to take care of the shop. Okay. All right? Uh, I call it right to operate at, at a baseline, right? The best thing I can think of right that comes to my head is you got to file your tax returns. Trust me, the B and the O and the I aren't going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you need some S to do that. And sometimes you outsource, right? How many people, a lot of small companies, they don't have an accountant or they don't, in the, in the company, they, they have a temporary service or whatever. We all, a lot of people have people to do their taxes, right? So that's what I would tell you. Policies, procedures. Process, structure. Financial discipline, safeguarding of assets, I can go on and on. But it's the analysis piece, what's going to be of most value, I mean, all of it, that's interesting. I know you've got to keep us going, so that's fine. The, the analysis piece, and it's got to be done in community care, right, is going to be the best thing for each of these folks. I mean, when I was at, uh, I worked in pharmaceuticals for a number of years, and uh, early kills were important. But you had to manage that because, again, the eyes took that very personally. So you had to really make sure you were delicate, careful, and stuck for how you. Because you wanted to make the, you didn't want them to just kill themselves too. So there's a balance there. Do the axes have meaning? I, I guess uh, you know you you kind of pointed out that there's uh, shades. Some people are closer to the line. Yeah. In like, other words, what are the? This is they're just a, you know they're just the quadrants. So in other words, these are here. You know, somebody way up here. Everything I said, right? Somebody down here. I think in the disco they call it the chameleon. They can kind of acclimate to either one. They can they can exercise either way, right? But these are just extremes. This is a pure service. This is a service leaning towards innovation. This is a service leaning to builder. It's ways your your second could be your secondary. Some of you got two scores. Some got three, maybe all four. Depends on where you are, how extreme you are in that one. Did I answer the question? Yeah, I got a lot of stuff with this, and I was thinking on the parallels, and it seemed, you know, a lot of similarities, but a bit different. Like, you know, in this, you have the I, and here, I think the I is split between the O and the I, whereas, where in this, you have the S and the C, and I think they both collapse kind of down in the uh, service. But, but other than I think, you know, an application of this is, you know, if we get involved with the acquisitions or so, like we're doing it, we're working on an acquisition of a company. It's grown from zero to 40 million in three years' time. And you go out and you raise money and everybody says, well, why did this guy want to sell? Well, this would tell him. He's very much high service, but it's getting to the point where he needs to build infrastructure. There's, there's, not a, there's hardly any B in his body, and the need to get to the next level, the need B. Exactly. And yeah. so finally, we, we, we don't say it quite like that, but you know, someone yeah. you know, gets it and the guy, yeah. Thank you for that comparison. That's that's perfect. And you know, in this again, this mm, I don't know if that's more of a personality thing. Um, you have a lot of builders. And somebody said introverts and extroverts. You have some builders that are very introverted, but they have an intensity that's infectious. You know, when they talk, people lean in. You have hunting commercial. No, a lot of people are too young. <laughs> yeah. um, but you do. And you've all had experts for interviews. So it, it kind of goes across the grains. Remember, this is not how people, it's the lens in which they make business decisions. It's where, what's their value. I want to sit on the beach. I want to scale. And how they do that is a lot of it's based on their personality. They could be like this, or they can be. <coughs> soft, uh, what is that? Uh, speak softly with carry a big step. What's the difference between being a capital <coughs> lowercase letter? Capital usually would suggest that you're further 
you're more pure. You're, you're pure into the quantum. That's a very big piece for you. <coughs> Somebody here, or here, would be maybe a smaller. That's what I was asking Kepler that. Yes? It's speculative. Where would you put like a Stephen Jobs on this scale? You know, Stephen, um, you know, he is probably a B and an I. And he innovates, but the guys, and think about how he treats and what he does with people. Mm -hmm. um, when I think about B.O., how about Richard Branson? <coughs> Does that resonate with people? It's a much better combination. Yeah. So, but those cross quadrants can get, you know, if you're the mad scientist but the mad builder, crazy builder, <coughs> That creates people like you know, Steve and, and others. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Well, again, if you have further questions on it or you want to explore it more deeply, certainly give me a shot. But otherwise, uh, appreciate your attention and interest, and uh, thanks for having me. All right.